Now, Falkirk isn't just the town where he was born. It is the site of William Wallace's greatest defeat. This is a story of strategy, betrayal, and how technology helps win battles. This is the story of the Battle of Falkirk of 1298. Come with me. So the Battle of Falkirk took place within the First Scottish War of Independence, a war that was sparked due to a succession crisis. Here, let me show you. Right, so here's a very quick overview of the First Scottish War of Independence, some of the key events up to the Battle of Falkirk. Um, so yeah, First Scottish War of Independence um, essentially starts in 1296, uh, when King Edward I of England, also known as Longshanks, sacked Berwick in 1296, um, starting the First Scottish War of Independence. One of the main battles, um, field battles that is, in the First Scottish War of Independence in the first year of that war, in 1296, uh, was the Battle of Dunbar, uh, which was a resounding victory uh, for England. Then in 1297, our hero enters. William Wallace rises up um, and he eventually joins forces with a, a rebellion leader in the north of Scotland at that time called Andrew Murray, somewhat of a forgotten hero of the First Scottish War of Independence. Then later in 1297, one of the most famous battles in Scottish history takes place when Wallace and Murray link up at the Battle of Stirling Bridge and inflict a devastating defeat against England at the Battle of Stirling Bridge. I have made a video on Stirling Bridge that you can watch after this one. Um, but yeah, that, that's some of the key events. And then we get to 1298. 1298, the Battle of Falkirk, the battle we are discussing. So that's a very quick overview of the First Scottish War of Independence. Up to that point, some of the key events that lead to the Battle of Falkirk in 1298. But where was the battle fought? Where was the Battle of Falkirk fought? Well, some argue it was directly behind me. Um, behind me is just the south of Callander Wood. And that is one site that's been posited as the potential site of the Battle of Falkirk. Now, after the success of the Battle of Dunbar, King Edward went south again to England before dealing with matters on the continent. After the rise of Wallace and defeat at the Battle of Stirling Bridge, Edward had to act. After agreeing a truce with France, Edward began preparing for his second invasion of Scotland, moving the centre of government to York to prepare the final plans. Edward soon marched into Scotland with an army of around 14,000 men. It is within this context that the Battle of Falkirk took place. King Edward reached the outskirts of Edinburgh in two weeks, expecting to resupply by sea, but this was delayed due to the weather. He soon pushed on to Linlithgow. Now, Wallace and his army were hesitant to meet Edward's army face on and engaged in a Scots Earth policy, burning the land as they moved north. And this was actually proving very effective. Edward was on the verge of falling back to Edinburgh when intelligence spotted Wallace and his army at Torwood, near Falkirk. Edward ordered an immediate march to Falkirk. Now this is Wallace Stone. The story goes that as the English army marched into Falkirk, they saw a flash of armour up here on the hill. It was Wallace and his army spying on the approaching English. Now this is where things get interesting. Why did Wallace engage in battle? His Scotch Earth policy was working. The English were running low on supplies and had to deal with a mutiny at one point. They may not have pursued Wallace any further if he had fled north. After all, Wallace was known more for his guerrilla warfare tactics than his skill as a general in a pitched battle setting. His co-commander at Stirling Bridge was also dead, Andrew Murray, mortally wounded at Stirling. And perhaps if Murray was alive, Wallace and Murray would have won the Battle of Falkirk, as Murray was probably more skilled in a pitch battle setting. Perhaps Wallace was tired of running, however, or perhaps he was overconfident after Stirling. Regardless, the Scottish army moved down from the hilltop and prepared for battle. Wallace famously said, I have brought you to the ring, now dance if you can. At the battle, the Scots were outnumbered. Estimates of around 6,000 Scots versus a force of 14 to 15,000 English. The Scots had a defensive formation they thought could give them an edge. Shiltrons, tight circular formations of spearmen, known as pikemen, who were difficult to penetrate. The English had an ace up their sleeve, however, the longbow. Perhaps originating with the Welsh, the English went on to use the longbow with great effect in warfare. After initial English attacks against the Shiltron weren't overly effective, Edward pulled his forces back and ordered his archers forward. A rain of arrows battered the Shiltrons and eventually caused gaps to appear. 
Edward then ordered his cavalry and infantry to clean them up, scattering the Scots. It was a resounding victory for the English, and it's thought to have been the first victory of the longbow in a major battle. The Scottish cause wasn't helped by many of the Scottish cavalry, fleeing before the battle even started however. Many Scottish nobles benefited from English lands and titles, and effectively betrayed William Wallace at the Battle of Falkirk. Two nobles who didn't betray the cause, however, were Sir John Graham and Sir John Stuart, both of whom lost their lives at the Battle of Falkirk, but they're remembered to this day. This is the memorial fountain to Sir John Graham in Falkirk, and his name is found in place names around this area, such as the Grahamston district of Falkirk. After the battle, Edward went on to occupy Stirling and raided Perth, St Andrews and Ayrshire, yet he retreated to Carlisle by September. Edward invaded again in the summer of 1300, however. Wallace resigned as Guardian of Scotland shortly after Falkirk, and he was replaced by none other than Robert the Bruce. Edward never forgot Wallace, however. He hunted him for years, capturing him in August 1305 near Glasgow. He was convicted of treason and hung, drawn and quartered in London. His head was displayed on London Bridge, and his limbs were displayed separately in Newcastle, Berwick, Stirling and Perth as a warning to others. Less than a decade later, the man who took over the guardianship of Scotland after Wallace, Robert the Bruce, won a resounding victory at the Battle of Bannockburn. To find out more, please click here. Thanks for watching, please subscribe and hit the bell. If you would like to support this work through Patreon, buymeacoffee.com, um, all the links will be in the description below. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you next time.